Software and Security Engineering Lecture 5, Segment 2. I hope you managed to spot that this lockbox protocol is completely insecure. And the reason is that Caesar can cause his servant to bring the lockbox to him rather than giving it to Brutus. So Anthony puts the, the message in the box, sends it to Caesar thinking he's sending it to Brutus. Caesar puts a padlock on it sends it back to Antony and tells his slave that, to say that it's just come from Brutus. Antony removes his padlock and sends the box back to Caesar, who can now undo his padlock and get the message out, and gets the message, uh, Dear Brutus, let's murder Caesar. Yours, Antony. So now Caesar has got hanging evidence against Antony, and he runs the protocol again um, with Brutus and gets hanging evidence against Brutus, and he can then um, have both their heads cut off in the Forum on the Ides of March rather than dying himself, um, as happened all those years ago. So um, this should make clear that if you run a key establishment protocol like this, you may manage to set up a secret with someone, but you've no idea with whom you have set that secret up. You may have good secrecy, but you've got no authenticity. Now let's look at the electronic version. As you saw in discrete maths, a naive electronic version can be done by using modular exponentiation as a one-way function, in fact, as a one-way homomorphism. Um, Alice can send to Bob the message M um, encrypted by raising it to the power RA, where she knows the random number RA, and Bob can then send it back, having raised it to the power RB, and um, Alice can then undo her exponentiation and Bob can undo his. Um, but this is inconvenient because you've got to do fiddly stuff to encode messages as group elements. So how Diffie-Hellman usually goes is that you pick a large prime number P, typically um, longer than 2,000 bits, um, if you don't want anybody to be able to compute discrete logarithms any time soon. And you pick a generator G mod P, that is, it generates um, uh, a subgroup of order uh, P minus 1, or not too much smaller than P minus 1. Uh, and um, Alice then sends to Bob G to the power RA, Bob sends to Alice G to the power RB, and this enables them both to create a session key, G to the RARB, which they can then use to encrypt a message using um, any old um, symmetric cipher of their choice. Um, and of course, as in our previous slide, Alice and Bob have managed to set up this new session key with each other, but they've got no idea with whom that key has been established. So it gives them secrecy, but it does not give them authenticity. You need something else to do the authenticity. The next point is that Alice and Bob don't have to be both present at the same time. And with only a very small modification, you can turn this into a public key encryption scheme, uh, whereby Bob um, can send a message to Alice given knowledge of her public key, which could be stored in a directory or in a certificate on our website. And this is sometimes known as El Gamal public key encryption, sometimes it's known as Diffie-Hellman encryption, and let's just revise how that goes. You start with a generator G, modulo a large prime P, as before. Alice chooses her private key XA, and this usually signifies a long-term private key that she might hold for months or uh, perhaps even a year. She publishes her public key YA equals uh, G to the power XA mod P and makes this publicly available by means of a certificate or a, a directory server or whatever. And now to encrypt a message M under YA, Bob chooses a session key R and he forms the encryption as uh, two elements. The first element is G to the power R, a public version of the private session key. And this is all done modulo P. Uh, and then he takes Alice's uh, public key, YA, and raises that to the power R, the private session key, and uh, multiplies this by M. And um, Alice can then decrypt this by calculating um, G to the power R, that is the public um, key to the power XA, which is just the same as G to the power RXA is G to the power XA R, which is YA to the power R, and she can divide out to get M. 
So how can we use this in an actual protocol? Here's a protocol that was proposed in 1978 when public key cryptography had just been invented by Roger Needham and Mike Schroeder. Um, Alice sends to Bob Alice's nonce followed by Alice's name, all encrypted under Bob's public key. Bob then sends to Alice Alice's nonce followed by Bob's nonce, all encrypted under Alice's public key. So Bob has shown that he controls Bob's private key by being able to decrypt um, the nonce NA. Alice then sends to Bob um, Bob's nonce back again, NB, encrypted under Bob's public key, KB. And the idea was that they then use NA, XR, NB, or perhaps hash of NA and NB as a shared key. So um, here's the next um, puzzle for you. Is this actually a sound protocol? Have a think.